Welcome to our presentation on diversity and online learning. Given the phenomenal response we received from our last webinar with Sharon Bookbinder, entitled Tips for Creating an Effective Learning Environment in an Online Course, we have asked her to come back and record this webinar focused on diversity in online learning. At any point during the presentation, please feel free to pause the presentation to take notes or a screenshot, should you choose to do so. Uh, so now let me introduce you to our presenter. Dr. Sharon Bookbinder is a professor and program coordinator of the master's program in healthcare management, and bachelor's program in business administration at Stevenson University Online. She is also author of two titles for Jones and Bartlett Learning, one of the bestsellers on our health administration list, Introduction to Healthcare Management, as well as Cases in Healthcare Management. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Sharon Bookbinder. Well, I hope everyone is doing well, staying safe and comfortable. Uh, today's experience uh, that I'd like to share with you about diversity comes from a very deep place within me. I was, uh, I volunteered to do the diversity plan for a large university, my previous employer, and I saw the impact that diversity can have on something like graduation rates. So this has been going, an ongoing interest of mine and I've carried it over from the face-to-face -face world into the online world. And so at the end of this session, participants will be able to identify dimensions of diversity, reflect on the impact of diversity in the online teaching and learning environment, analyze conflicts in given scenarios, and create mentoring tips for other instructors. We're gonna address objective one first, identify dimensions of diversity. When we talk about diversity, quite often what leaps to people's minds is culture of origin, race, ethnicity, language, and maybe they'll think about gender, gender roles and sexual identity, but there are many, many more dimensions of diversity than just those two. Uh, when we talk about age, uh, what decade is someone from? What generation? What are the generational touchstones? They're different for all of us across the generations. My generational touchstone is the assassination of President Kennedy. For others, the touchstone is the Challenger explosion. Learning styles. There are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. I'm one of the rare people who's been tested, I'm told, who has absolutely no learning ability in the kinesthetic realm. So that was interesting. So that explains why I'm visual and auditory. Formal education is a dimension of diversity. You could have no formal education, elementary, high school, college, postgraduate. And then there's social class, the upper 1% who are bazillionaires, uh, the upper class, the middle and lower class. Some other dimensions include a home. Do you own, rent, lease, or are you homeless? That's a very different experience. Someone can be you know, homeless one day and have a home the next, but it's very impactful on their lives and how they're treated. Employment status, whether you're employed or unemployed, retired, maybe you're on social security disability insurance, these are all very important in terms of how we are perceived in terms of status and in how people interact with us. Uh, physical health, health status. Is your health, health good? Is it poor? Is it excellent? What's your fitness level? Can you barely walk up a flight of stairs versus can you go for a jog? And then ability slash disability. And because this is such a big area, and due to the complexity of the disability uh, inclusion will not be addressed in this presentation. Family origin, biological versus adopted versus in vitro fertilization or surrogacy procreation are very different ways of having children. These days, when children are asked about their parents in school, they may say, I have two mommies or I have two daddies. And that impacts how they may be perceived in the classroom or in the rest of the world. 
marital status? Are you single, married, unmarried, living with a partner, separated, divorced, widowed, widower? I'm old enough to remember when being divorced was a big deal. And my mother was a divorcee. And believe me, the small town I came from, it was not a good status to have. Belief system. There's spiritual, there's religious, organized religion. Your political party might be your belief system. And maybe you believe in Area 55 in Roswell, New Mexico. Geography. Country, state, region, even zip codes. Baltimore as a city, I find, has very unique people and businesses and cultures by zip code. Occupation. Career, stage of career, role in organization, military versus civilian. It's a lot of difference between people in these areas. So these are lots of dimensions of diversity, but what others can you think of? What I'd like you to do is take a moment to jot these down. Diversity equals differences. Diversity issues such as language differences, religious differences, cultural differences, and all those other differences we discussed are not disparities in and of themselves. They're just differences. But when these differences are not understood or valued and appreciated for the impact on the delivery of healthcare or education, then they become contributors to disparities and unequal outcomes. What does this mean? It means that we need to think about our own bias. Researchers from Harvard and the University of Washington created a web-based assessment of automatic preferences for one group over another, and this is implicit, Project Implicit. They found 88% of whites and 48% of black respondents were biased against black. Let me repeat, 88% of white and 48% of black respondents were biased against blacks. Latino and Asian respondents also show a pro-white bias. 68% of non-Arab, non-Muslim respondents and 36% of Arab Muslim respondents were biased against Arab, Arab Muslims. So let's reflect on the impact of diversity in the online teaching and learning environment. What does this mean to us? Why does it matter? I've had people argue with me that unless the faculty and students post videos or photos of themselves that they are invisible. Now that we're using Zoom more and other tools so we can have video conferencing, it's highly unlikely that a student will have a blank space next to their face or that the faculty will. Yet each person comes to the classroom with their own identity kit, which includes their name. And as the saying goes, what's in a name? The answer is everything. Some groundbreaking research in 2003 found that names and addresses matter to potential employers. Now consider the following in the researcher's own words. I'm gonna paraphrase as we go through this. The researchers randomly assigned very white sounding names to half the resumes and very African-American sounding names to the other half. They were also interested in how credentials affected discrimination and they experimentally varied the quality of the resumes used in response to a given ad. The higher quality applicants had on average a little more labor market experience and fewer holes or gaps in their employment history. They were also more likely to have an email address and have completed some certification degree, possess foreign language skills, or have been awarded some honors. Keep in mind the date on this research, hence everybody nowadays pretty much should have an email address, but at that time, not everyone did. The researcher said, we typically send four resumes in response to each ad, two higher quality and two lower quality ones. They randomly assigned to one to the higher and one to the lower quality resumes, an African-American sounding name. In total, they responded to over 1,300 employment ads in sales, administrative support, clinical and customer services. We're not talking executives here. And sent nearly 5,000 resumes to a large spectrum of job quality from cashier work to sales management. 
they found that white names received 50% more callbacks for interviews. They also found that race affects the benefits of a better resume. For white names, a higher quality resume is elicited 30% more callbacks, whereas for African Americans, it elicits a far smaller increase. Applicants who lived in better neighborhoods received more callbacks, but this effect did not differ by race. The amount of discrimination was found to be uniform across occupations and industry. Federal contractors and employers who list equal opportunity employer in their ad discriminate as much as other employers. They found little evidence that their results were driven by employers inferring something other than race, such as social class, from the names. These results suggested that racial discrimination is still a prominent feature of the labor market. And I would go on to say that it's still a prominent feature in our current environment. So these students are not invisible, nor are the faculty. So in the absence of these visible identifiers, here are some things that you will find in an online learning environment that will give you an idea about who they are and where they come from. Introductions, they're telling you about yourself, what their job is, you know, perhaps you ask them a question like, you know, tell me something fun, uh, and they tell you and it may, you know, you're gonna have different experiences there and different people and writing style. Uh, different cultures, different languages have different writing styles. I took two years of German when I was in college. I spent time in Germany and uh, that's a very different language structure. So when people come to English as a second language, the structure of their language may dominate the English language structure. So that's always something to think about when you're reading someone's postings. How they communicate with other students and with faculty. Do they say, hey, Sharon, uh, or do they say, hi, Dr. Bookbinder? Um, how do they approach group work? What are their attitudes towards using others' work without attribution? In some cultures, plagiarism is considered flattery because you, the student, thought that work was so good that they would repeat it. And then again, the generational touchstones that I talked about before. What other things can you think of that might make your student not so invisible in your learning environment? Take a moment to jot these down. We are in the midst of changing demographics, and I'd like to start with race and ethnicity in the United States. As you can see from the table in front of us, our changing population is really changing. Uh, we have projections be that by 2050, our population will be 438 million in the United States, but our shares in terms of racial and ethnic groups will be dramatically changing. Our Hispanic population will almost double from 14% to 29%. Our white population will relatively shrink from 67% to 47%. And our black population will remain about the same as along with our Asian population, which will grow a little more modestly. Now, keep in mind these estimates were from 2008 and recent policies restricting access to the United States and immigration policies may impact these numbers, uh, but this is, these are the numbers that were published at that time. Changing demographics in terms of sex and age. Women are living longer than men. This has been happening for a very long time. Our life expectancy as a female is in some parts of the world five to ten years longer than males. When you look at the percent of distribution of the United States population by age group, you can see that we're aging. I am in the 65 to 84 group and I see my piece of the pie getting bigger, but what is next to that is the green piece of pie that says 85 years and older is also growing. We're living longer, unless you get ill, we're living longer and people are working longer. So that gives us lots of generations in the workforce. We can probably see, if we look around and look really hard, there are five generations in the workforce. 
we have what is known as the silent generation to the far right on your slide. That is our World War II generation. And many of those in that generation are now passing away. Uh, but the baby boomers were still going strong. And I know many baby boomers who are still working well into their 70s and some into their 80s. Generation X is, you know, that mid-range. My son's about to fall into that range, not quite. And then the millennials and Generation Z, the youngest group. So we have five generations working together in the workforce and in the classroom. What does that mean? Well, there are some generalizations that we can make about the generational differences. Uh, Rodriguez in 2015 uh, gave us this table in his work. He suggests that when you look at the work eth ethics and values of the silent generation, that hard work, respect, authority, sacrifice, duty before fun, adhering to rules was key. When it came to baby boomers, we're the workaholics. We work efficiently, crusading causes, personal fulfillment, desire quality, and question authority. Then there's Gen X. They eliminate the task. They want self-reliance and structures and direction. They're pretty skeptical. Millennials are multitaskers. Uh, they are typing on their computer at the same time they're on their phone, at the same time that they're talking to someone. Work for these generations varies. The silent generation says work is an obligation. Baby boomers, it's an exciting adventure. Let's go. For Generation X, it's a difficult challenge. It's a contract. What's in that contract? And for the millennials, it's a mean to an end. It's a fulfillment. So what's the leadership style for these different generations? Silent generations, directive, command, and control, like the military. Baby boomers, it's consensual and collegial. For the Gen X, everyone's the same, challenge others, ask why. The millennials, we're not quite sure at this point in time what their leadership style will be. Interactive style for the silent generation is individual, the rugged individualist, the you know Gary Cooper of the generation. Baby boomers, your team player, we love to have meetings. Gen X, entrepreneurs, and millennials are participative in their interactive style. In terms of communications, the silent generation prefers a formal memo. Baby boomers like to have their conversations in person and face-to-face. -face. Gen X like direct and immediate information. And the millennials want email, voicemail, and what's not on here is text. For feedback and rewards, the silent generation says no news is good news if satisfaction is job well done. Baby boomers don't appreciate it. They want money and title and recognition. So Gen X, how am I doing? Freedom is the best reward is their response for feedback and rewards. And for millennials, whenever I want it at the push of a button, they'll have meaningful work. Now, here's a few tips for managing multiple generations in your classroom. Don't overgeneralize. Those tables before were really generalizations. And we all know that if you are not careful, you can overgeneralize. So just put that up front for you. Not every millennial needs instant gratification. Not every baby boomer is a team player. Uh, so we need to be aware of the differences, but treat each student as an individual. Do focus on goals and set clear expectations. And that's, that's important for everyone in your class. Clear goals and expectations puts each generation on an even playing field. There's no need for micromanaging just to set the goal. Next, just set the goal and exploit. Do encourage each generation of students to mentor each other. They each provide different strengths, experiences, and knowledge. And peer learning is just as important as learning from faculty. I love the discussion boards where students talk to each other about their lives and the work that they're doing. And many times there's people in my class that are 10, 20 years apart. And so the older students can impart some wisdom to the younger ones, and the younger ones can teach the older ones some new tricks too. Take suggestions and use them. As a student, uh, it is you know, very easy to find stuff. I mentioned in my previous webinar that I had one student who found an error, and I heard about it for almost the rest of the course. 
it can be challenging to faculty to accept the students and their feedback that and that they may have some better way to do something. Take the suggestion and acknowledge the contribution of the students to the teaching and learning experience. It's, we're all in this together. Do encourage career planning and help students to envision how the work they're doing in your class fits into that career. People work harder if they understand how it leads them on a path to their professional goals. I hated geometry. I had no idea what I would do with it. So how can you take the work that you're giving your students and help them apply it to their lives? Encourage balance. Employees and students of all ages place a high value on balancing their work and personal lives. And this is particularly important in healthcare, medicine, and nursing. Uh, I came from the generation where physicians worked 80 hours a week. They were never home for dinner. And that was just the norm. And now physicians want a life. They want to balance it out. So you're going to see more and more demands for balancing life. So how can you help them? Well, many of our students are working adults with families who sometimes need to be reminded it's okay to take some time off when their lives are out of balance. You may need to think about an extension on the paper. You may need to suggest to them that they rethink taking a course next semester or decreasing their workload. So these are some aspects you can help with. So are we a melting pot or a stew? Um, I kind of like that picture because it shows us as different but all in the same bowl. Are we blended or separate ingredients with respect to our dimensions of diversity? Or are we a jigsaw puzzle, an amalgam of pieces in which the whole becomes greater than the parts? What is identity? Does it change over time and as we age? Are parts of us static and foundational and other parts of us still growing? Take a moment to jot down your identity. And then take another moment to jot down what you believe your students' identities are. This is recent data uh, from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the most recent data they had for us from 2015, 2016. And you can see uh, the percentage of associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees by race and ethnicity and sex. And if you look closely at this chart, um, you'll see that it is more females. There are more females in higher education than males more getting their associate's degrees, more getting their bachelor's degrees. We're also seeing more Asian Pacific Islanders, more whites, and then more two or more races, and of course, the growing population, more Hispanics, especially in the baccalaureate level. However, while our students are diverse and are growing in terms of numbers, we're not. U.S. college students, according to the Pew Research Center, are twice as likely to be, as faculty, to be black and four times as likely to be Hispanic. If you look at the chart from the top to the bottom, you'll see the students that are represented by faculty, in fact, overrepresented by faculty, are the white students and the Asian students. And right on the line is the Pacific Islander. Underrepresented that students are Native American, Alaska Native, two or more races, Black and Hispanic, and basically all white. So what's it all about, Alfie? And the footnote says, if you know what this refers to, you're not a millennial. Majority of faculty are white, and majority of faculty are over the age of 40. Students are diverse and richly multicultural, and more than half are over the age, under the age of 40. Many students are working adults with multiple time demands. And the bottom line is that we need, as instructors and faculty, to be informed but not assume things about our students. We can set goals, have standards and clear expectations, and clarify often. And above all, have a sense of humor because you will need it. Objective three. We're going to give you some conflicts in some given scenarios, like little mini case studies. And there's a lot of meat in there. And we're going to talk about the first one, which is a gender and sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and age and generation conflict, because all these diversity issues can overlap each other. 
In this scenario, Professor Janice Jones, who's 55, is teaching an undergraduate sociology course. In the class is Jorge Rodriguez, a 20-year-old student leader in an LBTQ plus organization and a club for Latin American students and is, identifies as they slash them. They are the first in their generation to attend college. Another member of this class is a 38-year-old white male, George Masters, who's attending on veterans benefits and identifies as he, him. He was deployed to the Middle East three times. He's married with six children. And George's introduction included the statement that the woman's place is in the home. He's also the first in his family to attend college. In a discussion board about gender as a social construct, these two students get into a profanity-laced argument over the role of transgender troops in the military. Other students in the class are uncomfortable and are sending Professor Jones emails. What should Professor Jones do? Take a few moments to jot down your thoughts and coaching tips will be discussed at the end of this presentation. Scenario two is a student-faculty conflict. Remember, the first one was student-to-student. -student. This is a student-to-faculty. This involves gender, uh, generation and age, and country of origin. It's 11 p.m. on a Sunday night, and 65-year-old Professor Ball is just about to go to bed when he receives a text message on his cell phone from Felicity Bella, a foreign-born student who is questioning a grade. Professor Ball is quite taken aback and very annoyed. Yet another millennial instant gratification seeker. What should Professor Ball do? Take a few moments to jot down your thoughts. Again, coaching tips will be discussed at the end. The next one is a student-faculty conflict scenario also. One is social class, learning style, race, and ethnicity. Professor Julia Smith, age 42, is grading a mountain of undergraduate essays. The professor opens the last one and wants to cry. The basic mechanics of writing appear to have eluded the student. When Professor Smith returns the paper to the student with extensive feedback and a failing grade, the enraged student calls Professor Smith repeatedly, leaving messages and shouting, I've never had anyone say I couldn't write before. You need to give me a better grade. This is on you. What should Professor Smith do? Take a few moments to jot down your thoughts. The st dreaded student project, group project. Always filled with potholes, teamwork can be a real challenge. In this case, we're gonna be talking about employment status, marital status, and occupation as part of the group project problems. While having dinner with friends, Professor Wiener, age 62, receives a stream of text messages from a student. The student had elective major surgery during the eight-week session of class and took a 10-day vacation since she had taken time off from work for the procedure. The student's with her family in a resort in rural Virginia and has just discovered there's no Wi-Fi in the resort, nor is there a business center. The student is texting Professor Wiener to ask for assistance with the group project. It's worth 30% of the grade which is due in three days. The student does not have her teammates' phone numbers in her phone. Would Professor Wiener please let her teammates know she's going to be late with her part of the project? What should Professor Wiener do? Take a few moments to jot down your thoughts. We'll be talking about these tips in a little bit. Objective four, this is where we give you partial solutions to those scenarios and some mentoring tips. So we're gonna create some mentoring tips for other instructors and perhaps for yourselves. The first scenario, the student to student uh, scenario is a volatile situation and has to be stopped as soon as possible. Uh, Professor Jones has the obligation to ensure a safe learning environment for the students and these two students are being disruptive. The following are some steps that can be taken. One, take screenshots of the discussion board to document the incident and inform her supervision, supervise the situation immediately. Delete the inappropriate threads. They don't belong there. Other students don't need to come in and see them. It could be very upsetting to them. Post an announcement reminding all students of the student policy manual and that all students are expected to be civil and respectful of one another in all their interactions. Most online courses have netiquette 
And if the students are in violation of that, they need to be required, reminded of that as well. Email each student that they have to set up a phone appointment with the professor. Her supervisor may want to be on the calls as a witness. If there's an officer within the university for judicial affairs, this might be an opportunity to ask someone from that office to sit in as well. Prior to the phone appointments, the professor may also wish to contact the Office of Multicultural Affairs for guidance. What are the rules of thumb that that office would like to have? What other coaching tips can you give to Professor Jones? Take a moment and jot them down. The student faculty conflict two is the student texting Professor Ball. First of all, Professor Ball should not text the student back, especially while annoyed. Professor Ball should not assume the student's a millennial. They're not the only generation that likes to text. Also, the student comes from a different country where texting might be the norm because internet service is spotty. Professor Ball should email the student the next day when calm and point out that he provided his cell phone number to students for emergencies such as illness, not about grade disputes. He should tell the student he'll review the grade and get back to her by email within 48 hours. What other coaching tips can you give to Professor Ball? Student faculty conflict. Professor Smith has several in this one. Uh, we have the writing problems. We have the student who's calling repeatedly, the angry messages. Uh, this happened to me. I had a student who was enraged. And I received uh, phone calls on my cell phone uh, all day and all night from the student. I had to block her. Uh, assuming that this is not the student's first submission, Professor Smith might go back to the student's earlier work, such as their introduction and discussion board postings, and see if there were similar issues. If her previous work was as poorly written as the essay, then Professor Smith might want to reflect on how she used that information. Did she provide robust feedback to the student that wasn't incorporated in the student's next submission? Did Professor Smith refer her to a writing center or other supports? Was this a first assignment or a cumulative assignment? Where are we in terms of the course? But if she has provided regular, robust feedback and the student has not incorporated it into her work, then this is a teachable moment. She has an opportunity to coach the student on her writing. After collecting data and reviewing the syllabus, Professor Smith can send the student an email indicating she would like a phone appointment to discuss her submission. Assuming the student can remain calm, and that should be part of the ground rules, Professor Smith can review the student's previous submissions and point to where she gave feedback and guidance. She can also point to the syllabus which says students should incorporate faculty feedback into subsequent assignments or they risk losing points in their work. If the student is still unhappy with her grade, Professor Smith can provide her with the information to appeal her grade after the course is over and grades are posted. What other coaching tips can you give to Professor Ball? The group project. Professor Wiener can call the student back after dinner and advise the student that being three days late with her part of a major project is not fair to her teammates. In fact, it could lead to her teammates giving her poor evaluations, leading to a poor grade in the course for the student. Professor Wiener can also suggest to the student that she may need to leave the resort and find a coffee shop with Wi-Fi to complete her part of the project. In the meantime, Professor Wiener can email the teammates and provide the exact information the student gave her in the text to them, along with the student's mobile phone number. Then it's up to the team to pull it all together and decide what they're going to do with this student who's on vacation. What other coaching tips can you give to Professor Wiener? We're going to revisit the learning objectives and thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, we really hope that this has given you the opportunity to identify dimensions of diversity, reflect on the impact of diversity in the online teaching and learning environment, and analyze conflicts in given scenarios, and create mentoring tips for other instructors. Thank you for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sharon. Um, the next three slides offer references for sources used in this presentation today. If you'd like to jot them down or take a screenshot, I encourage you to pause the recording. 
I will progress slowly through these next three slides. Um, so just bear with us for a second. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you have questions or comments you'd like to share, you can email me, Suzanne Walker, Sharon Bookfinder, and also we have a page below that links to additional online teaching resources. Thanks again, and this ends today's webinar.